Thank you, uh, members. We're now moving on to uh, questions to the Minister for Health, Mr. Robin Swan. Before I call um, the first person, which is Mr. Daniel McCrossan, could I advise the House that question number nine, standing in the name of Ms. Cara Hunter, has been withdrawn, and topical question number three, standing in the name of Mr. Gary Middleton, has been withdrawn. We have Mr. Daniel McCrossan. Uh, coming in over the internet, so if we could bring him up into the spotlight. Mr McCrossan. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, and just before I ask the Minister a question, I'd just like to put on record uh, my sincerest appreciation and thanks to all those carers uh, for those with Alzheimer's or dementia right across Northern Ireland who are doing great work in supporting uh, the vulnerable people of our society who are battling this awful, awful illness. Uh, question one, Minister. Um, I, I thank the member. Uh, work carried out to date has already made significant improvements to the lives and well-being of people with a dementia and their carers, and it is vital that we continue to push forward with this work. In 2019, regional dementia leagues, integrated care partnerships and trusts uh, established multi-agency working groups to consider what arrangements, structures and resources were required to support the rollout of the regional dementia care pathway. Legacy funding from the Delivery Social Change Dementia Signature Programme supported the recruitment of two dementia service improvement leads in each trust, with specific responsibility for coordinating the pathway implementation programme within their respective trusts. The Regional Dementia Lead and Commissioning staff at the HSCB have drawn up a detailed commissioning specification and invited the local implementation groups to submit investment proposal templates to support the implementation of a prototype within each area to be completed and returned to the Health and Social Care Board by the 30th of June this year. The implementation structures have been agreed to include a regional steering group who will have oversight of implementation across all five trust areas, which will ensure consistency and shared learning, a regional stakeholder reference group, local multi-agency and disciplinary implementation groups, including people with a dementia and carers, and the expectation is that a pathway will be rolled out across all areas within a three-year time frame, subject to the availability of any funding necessary. As members will know, we face and are likely to continue to face an extremely challenging fiscal environment. Before I call uh, Mr McCrossan for a supplementary, Minister, just some members have advised me they are struggling to hear you, so if you could maybe move your, your mic so we bit closer. Mr McCrossan for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for that answer. Uh, Minister, those living with dementia have been worst hit by the pandemic, with NISRA's published statistics indicating that dementia and Alzheimer's disease was the most common pre-existing condition appearing in a third of all COVID-19 related deaths in Northern Ireland. Given that this week is Dementia Action Week, can you, Minister, outline what steps your department are taking to ensure that the views of those living with dementia are heard as we will build back a better health service? Um, and I, I thank the member, and I think in regards to some of the content and my, my previous answer in regards to the regional dementia lead uh, and the commissioning of staff that have been drawn up by the Health and Social Care Board, um, those implementation groups have been asked to submit uh, investment proposal templates to support the implementation of a prototype. That is due to end uh, that, implement, uh, that bidding process or that implementation process is due to end by the 30th of June. Uh, this year in regards to the reform of dementia services. Uh, my department has previously provided funding to support the rollout of actions from delivering social change dementia programme, and this has included the appointment of 10 dementia service improvement leads, 10 dementia navigators, 44 dementia champions, and in addition work is ongoing to support the rollout of products and findings from the delivering social change phase two programme, and that will be included and, and that takes account of input from users and suffer, uh, dementia sufferers as well in that co-production approach. Ms. Carolyn Killen. And Collier, and I want to thank the member for, for his question and the Minister for his response. He mentioned the reform of dementia care services, which is crucially important, and all the actions outlined in that. Can I ask the Minister, in relation to families, what support are they going to get, but particularly the CARES, and when does he intend to publish uh, the reform of his adult uh, social care services also. Um, and again, I, I thank the, the member for that important uh, question and the support for carers that do need 
because uh, they have had a, a particularly hard time um, over the past 14 months. And that social care uh, recommendations have still gone on and has been worked through through the, pro, through the department as, as well, because we have looked at those, especially in care homes uh, and people with a dementia, how we can support them through the Care Partner Programme so that we can ensure there was a familiar face, there was a family member who could get in, into homes to actually give them that support while they were in the care homes as well. So that work is ongoing, and as I say, is the vital piece for that of us is it is co-produced as well, because one of the things we have to do out of the last 14 months is actually learn from the lived experience of those people who suffered from dementia and their carers as well. Mr Keith Buchanan. Deputy Speaker, sorry, a uh, question too, please. Um, I thank the member for, for his question. Domiciliary care is an essential frontline community care service which has been sustained throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. Statutory and independent sector domiciliary care providers have liaised closely during the pandemic to maintain service provision. The pandemic has presented challenges for the sector, such as the suspension of some domiciliary care packages, packages at various stages, and that was at the request of service users or families to reduce the risk of contact on the transmission of the virus. Some domiciliary care providers have experienced COVID-19-related staff shortages, which led to changes in service provision. Trusts have worked to address these, for example, by reconfiguring service provision across geographical areas. Now and throughout the pandemic, health and social care trusts and providers have endeavoured to ensure any full or partial outstanding domiciliary care packages are still provided. As of the 26th of April of this year, there were 23,188 domiciliary care packages being provided in the community. Over the last 12 months, I am pleased to note that the social care workforce has expanded significantly, with an increase of 2,086 registered workers between May 2020 and April 21. While this is welcome, more staff are clearly still needed to ensure services continue to be delivered as and when they are required. Trusts aim to achieve timely discharge in every case. However, sometimes there are delays in getting people home. In some cases, this can be as the result of delays in getting the right care package in place, and there are also occasions where individuals are returned home into their family's care until a package can be implemented. While delays in implementation can be frustrating for all concerned, it is vital that the patient's safety and well-being remains at the forefront of decision-making in hospitals. Some £275 million uh, has been invested in domiciliary care in the financial year 2018-19, and the Department remains committed to providing a high-quality domiciliary care service to support people to remain in their home. I was about to say, if the Minister wanted to conclude, because Mr Buchanan has a supplementary, so he'll be able to get to the end of the text anyway. Mr Buchanan. Thank you, Mr uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister so far as an answer. Minister. Obviously, uh, care packages for people have been prior to COVID, and I appreciate COVID has put strain on that. Uh, and I'm still aware, no doubt, other members in the chamber are of issues across other areas, not only but Ulster. What is the, the financial situation with regard to bed blocking in respect to putting additional resources? I appreciate your point about the additional resources you have, but obviously there is still bed blocking going on, and still people not getting out in a timely manner, putting pressure on families and pressure on hospitals. So, is there any more resources you can put to this to prevent this in, in totality? Um, and I thank the, the member um, for that point, because it is about patient flow and flow management. And as constituency MLAs, we all know of those challenges when the, the appropriate care package is not available that some family members want to retain uh, their loved one in the hospital setting until that package is, is provided. I understand that there are currently several hundred fully or partially outstanding domiciliary care packages of care actually across Northern Ireland at present. And while this, this is not the situation that I want to see, uh, the trusts do have mitigation pre pre measures in place to ensure care is still provided to these individuals. And that is to ensure the continuation of care uh, that the trust actually sends a list of outstanding ca cases to both their in-house domiciliary care service and the, all the independent sector providers each day requesting their assistance with accepting these packages of care, either in full or in part. And that outstanding list is shared with the commissioning teams and key workers every evening for review and validation. So that is an ongoing process of that review of, of people who are still in hospital but need that support package. And, and I would urge it is not that they are viewed as bed blockers. It's basically until we get the appropriate care and support mechanisms in place to ensure that they are going home uh, to a safe environment. But it is vital that we get that flow right 
throughout our entire health service so that we can get as many people seen in the hospital setting. Mrs Rosemary Barton. Thank you. I thank the Minister for his answers so far. I too would like to put on record uh, my thanks to the domiciliary care staff and givers. They have um, provided uh, great service to those that have needed them, particularly over this COVID period, but also for many people that need them in their homes to be looked after there. Minister, in Fermanagh and South Tyrone, we have quite a n- number of problems in relation to domiciliary care packages. The domiciliary care packages are recommended, but it is actually getting the individuals to take up positions within the domiciliary care career pathway that we have difficulty with. And I want to know, what, Minister, what steps you are going to take to address, address uh, try and recruit new members? And I thank the member for her point, and if she noticed from, you know, from the original answer that I gave, I did not make the welcome that between May of last year and April this year, we have an additional 2,000 people actually working in that, that profession, a highly valued profession, but it has given them the support and recognition to do their jobs, but also about uh, a career for those who want a career in the service as well. Uh, I have recently established the Social Care Fair Work Forum. Uh, which will bring about representations from the, the health trade unions, the workers, uh, the service providers and the trusts as well, so that we can really identify how we progress uh, those who want to work in social care and actually make it uh, a job of choice for many that it is. But we do face, and the member rightly indicates, that in some areas across Northern Ireland, Ireland there is a geographical challenge in regards to uh, recruitment, so that has to be tackled and addressed through that piece of work as well. But it is about a whole systems approach, because no part of the, the health service works independently of any other part. Before I call the next person to ask a question, can I remind members in terms of short, sharp questions? I am as given to windiness as the rest of us, but I really think it is important. And to give us a perfect example of a short, sharp, focused question, Ms Emma Sheeran. Um, thanks, Minister, for your answers thus far. You'll remember that in November of last year, I had asked if your department kept a record of the number of people who sadly passed away whilst on um, the waiting list for a domiciliary care package. I'm thinking particularly of the sort of emotional stress that this causes for for families, particularly when loved ones ha- have a, a family member that is in a palliative situation or is is unwell, and they're going in to the to the house with the responsibility as opposed to spending precious time with a, with a member of their family. Can I ask if you have an update on that? I know you had committed in November of last year to look at that. Um, I, I thank the member. It is not an answer I have here with me today, but I will get back to the member in writing. Mr Colin McGrath. Thank you much, Mr Principal, Deputy Speaker, and I am sorry to hear about your windiness. Um, could I ask the uh, Health Minister if um, he could give me his assessment on carers' pay and if he agrees with me that the work that they have done during COVID-19 has just proved to us the absolute need that we have to have a fully resourced and well-paid staff in our domiciliary team? Um, and again, I, I thank the member and the Deputy Speaker does want medical help. I'm sure we could point him in the right direction. Uh, in regards to the issue that the member raises, the expert panel uh, report part of people that was actually published by my department in 2017 actually proposed that the care and support sector should be at least a living wage sector uh, as a first step to recognise it as a professional workforce. On the 13th of May uh, 2020, I announced that I intended to make uh, much-needed improvements in standardisation with regards to pay, training and career pathways for the social care workforce. And my officials are, are working to develop policy proposals in respect of providing a pay uplift, which will be part of a package of measures to improve opportunities for the social care workforce in line with the wider aims of the Departments of Health work, uh, actually to reform adult social care and its future sustainability. Um, for Northern Ireland, but in addition, as I said earlier, to addressing low pay, further measures have been delivered to improve the training, the education and career development opportunities available to this workforce, and I have invested funding to develop a social care workforce strategy for Northern Ireland, and that strategy will signal the commitment of my department to the strategic value of social care workforce within the health and social care service in Northern Ireland. Mr Jerry Carroll. Please. 
I thank the member for his question. The latest Health Inequalities Annual Report, published by my department on the 14th of April, highlighted that inequalities in health outcomes continues to be a key challenge. The report showed that alcohol and drug-related indicators continue to show some of the largest health inequalities monitored in Northern Ireland, with rates in the most deprived areas five times higher than that and the least deprived for drug-related mortality, and four times that for alcohol-specific mortality. Other large inequalities exist for teenage birth rates, smoking and pregnancy, and for healthy life expectancy. Inequalities in health outcomes primarily arise because of the inequalities and the conditions in which people are born, grow, live, work and age. These conditions influence the ability of individuals, families and communities to take control over their own lives and choices, and whether they are enabled and supported to lead long, healthy, active lives. My department leads on Making Life Better, which is the overarching strategic framework for public health through which the executive committed to creating the conditions for individuals, families and communities actually to take greater control over their lives and be enabled and supported to lead healthy lives. The pandemic has no, no doubt exacerbated existing inequalities and therefore my department and the PHA continue to deliver a range of actions to address the impact of COVID-19 and other health conditions and behaviours on the most deprived communities and reduced health inequalities. The Public Health Agency has also developed a short, medium and long-term plan for the recovery of health improvement services, the majority of which are focused in the most deprived communities. Thank the Minister for his answer. Figures recently that we discussed in the Health Committee showed that men in the deprived areas die uh, seven years younger than those in more affluent areas. The figure was five years for women. Really shocking figures. Belfast area and Strabane, uh, th- those areas, uh, 32 and 25 areas, where they perform less than the average areas for health uh, outcomes. Would the Minister agree with me that poverty is the main driver of these inequalities? In order to tackle the health inequalities, we need urgent action on poverty uh, eradication as well. I would fully agree with the member. Uh, and he knows when I addressed this issue at the Health Committee on Thursday. When we talk about health inequalities, that is the measure at the end. What we need to do as an executive, as a community and as an assembly is actually invest at the start. So we are supporting the community uh, and the individual throughout their entire life. As I said, you know, as I said and, and again in my answer, that those uh, inequalities are actually subject to the conditions in which people are born, grow, live, work and age. And if we, as an executive, can improve people's lived experience through their housing conditions, through their education, through their opportunity to work, through their opportunity to education and better life balance, uh, we can really challenge uh, those health inequalities. And that's something that I think is and should be at the core of our programme for government. Mr. Colin Gildernew. I got to last year, Corley. Minister, um, there has been no progress in terms of oral health outcomes, and we have some of the worst in these islands. Given the profound uh, health inequalities that exist and the underspends within the department, can you, Minister, now commit to allocating resources to address that inequality? Um, the current Northern Ireland oral health strategy was published actually back in 2007, um, but despite it says the main oral health problems described in the document and the approaches to prevention advocated by it remain largely valid today. And while it is still valid, it is accepted that in some instances uh, the settings or opportunities for pre- prevention have changed. As such, prior to COVID-19, uh, my department decided that the two sections of the Northern Ireland population that would benefit most from updated oral disease prevention programmes were young people and older adults. An Older Adults Health Options Group has been established and is chaired uh, by the Acting Chief Dental Officer. The oral health strategy for older adults is expected actually to be published later this year. Uh, in regards to the young people's oral health options group, has unfortunately been delayed until later this year, although some priority work has commenced. And the intention is for the groups to establish the oral health needs uh, of children and older adult, adults in Northern Ireland and review the evidence base to determine which preventative interventions are likely to be the most effective and cost effective. Mr. Stewart, thank you. Uh, Minister, um, one of the other inequalities in terms of health is the outcomes for screening. Uh, screening is so important for a wide range of illnesses and diseases, and yet it is those communities that you have made reference to where the least amount of screening take up happens. What is your department doing to encourage uh, take up of screening services? 
Um, and I thank the member for that, and he is right, and that's the challenge that continually just doesn't face my, my department, but also we work in collaboration with, with our PHA and our GPs as well. And it is about making screening accessible uh, to people in their own environments. The member will be aware you know, of the big bus that goes around for the cancer screening services as well, and it is about bringing that as close to people as possible, but also making them aware of the preventive, preventive measures that screening actually brings about. And that's what this is about, and I think that's what the debate in regards to health inequalities or the discussion should be about. It's whether prevention is better than cure or treatment. So the more screening that we can actually get people to take up, and it is about, it's about education, it's about awareness, but it's also about accessibility as well. Mr. Justin McNulty. Yeah, with lunch, Minister, this day three weeks ago, my son Satanta was born in Daisy Hill Hospital. My wife and I were overwhelmed by the quality of care we received from the maternity teams, the GPs, the doctors, the nurses, the midwives, the community midwives, porters, cleaning and catering staff. It was second to none. It was world class. It was exemplary. Minister, we do not know how to thank them. Minister, in relation to the question at hand, with the recently published Health Inequalities Report showing that the rates of alcohol specific mortality is the most, in, most, in the most deprived areas is four times that in the least deprived, can the Minister outline what steps his department is taking to tackle the problem with alcohol? And again, uh, in starting, can I congratulate the member uh, and his wife um, on, the born, on the birth of their child? I know there was a conversation earlier on when there was an allegation made by the chair of the health committee that the member was interested in to, to go to discos. Um, I would say, as a new father, that's the, I, I say as a new father, that would be the last thing uh, on the member's mind. Having, speaking from experience, a number of years ago. But in regards to the specific question that, that he does ask, in regards to the substance use strategy that has been worked through by my, my department as well, and acknowledging uh, that alcohol is actually still the drug of choice in Northern Ireland, and it's how we make that uh, strong challenge there, and, and the, the member will be aware or may not be aware that we're actually looking at, at a minimum unit pricing uh, strategy for Northern Ireland. Unfortunately, we're not as far as advanced uh, as we would like to be, but that is due to go out to consultation towards the end of this year, so that whoever takes up this post uh, following the next election, uh, that priority work will be already uh, have been done and have been started in regards to that. Mr. Philip McGuigan. Cahar, question number four. And again, I, I thank the member. The Health and Social Care Board has recently submitted proposals to my department, and I have asked that these be considered urgently, and I hope to announce a decision shortly. In developing these proposals, the Health and Social Care Board has been engaging extensively with the primary and secondary care sectors, as well as other stakeholder groups, to ensure that we have the right service offering to meet the needs of people in Northern Ireland. Once a final service model has been approved, work will be undertaken to rapidly deliver the appropriate services. Mr. McGregor. Uh, pre last can call you, and I thank the Minister for his, his response. I, I noted from some recent correspondence I got from the Chartered Society of Physi Physiotherapy stating that one in ten of those testing positive for COVID-19 have symptoms for 12 weeks or longer. They estimate that uh, there could be an additional need for 41 extra physiotherapy posts to address the community rehabilitation needs of COVID survivors here in the north. And obviously, uh, as the minister has pointed out, that the needs of long COVID patients will go uh, will include physiotherapy, but will go beyond just that. Uh, so, can I ask the minister to indicate what level of funding and resources he will be allocating to developing services for patients suffering from long COVID? Um, I, I thank the member for, for his question in regards to you know, who will make up those teams, and again, what we're looking at is that multidisciplinary ap approach as well. So there will be physiotherapists, primary care, secondary care uh, as well. In regards to the cost and proposals that have come, come forward to myself, they're not insignificant to establish this, uh, and in this reason, we're looking possibly at this year. Uh, and next year in a region of £2 million pound to supply this service. And it's not as simply as how much money I will allocate, it's how much money hopefully his party colleague and the Ministry of Finance will see this as a worthy cause to support in additional either bids or monitoring rounds from COVID monies as well, because as has been debated in this House, uh, this is a service that is needed. Mr Mervyn's story. You, Mr Deputy Speaker, and just to keep it in North Antrim, uh, I have to say it was good to see the five party monitoring coalition is working well when the minister is making a bid already for additional finances. 
those multidisciplinary teams, what, what assurance in terms of when they are made up and, and the planning that will go in, because the issue of long COVID is going to be with us, uh, excuse the pun, for a long time. Uh, can you ensure that facilities such as uh, Dalriada in Ballycastle and the Robinson in Ballymoney and our local health centres will play an important role given their strategic location and their importance uh, in our societies? Um, and I thank the member for, for the local question and, and who knows maybe when the bid comes to the executive, uh, the member may be able to either support that bid or approve that bid, uh, depending on what role he finds himself in, if, if any. But I can assure the member when uh, the full services and the deployment of uh, where we base uh, the long COVID supports, that will be part of the commissioning model in regards to make sure that we get the best supply uh, and locations across Northern Ireland. So I will not make any commitment at, at this point in time, but it is vital that these services are established and funded. Ms Paula Bradshaw. So, Deputy Speaker, um, Minister, I, I welcome the update on this long COVID service today, but you will know that I remain very concerned that the other post viral condition, that is ME, still does not have a fully commissioned service, despite there being 7,000 people across Northern Ireland. Could you please give us an update on that service? Thank you. Um, and again, I, I thank the member. I do not have an update here on, on the MD service as well, but I will say that the member has long called for the, the establishment of the COVID long COVID support model, and I, and I thank her for her consistency and persistency in regards to this as well, because again, once, once again, when it does come to that support of additional funding through the executive, I hope she can supply the same pressure on her ministerial colleague as well in regards to supporting that bid. But in regards to the specifics for ME, I will get back to the member in writing for an update and the recruitment for that position as well. Mr Alan Chambers. Deputy Speaker, I thank the Minister for his answer, and, and those that suffer from long COVID will welcome the announcement that the Board has completed its important piece of work. It is obviously very easy to draw comparisons uh, with England and, and, and what they are doing in relation to long COVID. Can the Minister confirm, however, that neither Scotland nor Wales are planning on following the English approach, and that they too are focusing much more on a multidisciplinary approach? And, I, and again, and I thank the mem member, and I think that's where some of this challenge has has come from in perception as to what we as a department have been doing. Uh, NHS England uh, announced uh, in October that they were supplying £10 million of funding that would be investment in the establishment of a number of multidisciplinary clinics for people, uh, and these clinics would improve again multidisciplinary teams, the same as as we're looking at multidisciplinary approach. But I understand. Um, that neither Scotland nor Wales are currently planning to follow uh, England's approach in respect to the establishment of the specialist assessment clinics. In Scotland to date, the focus has been on developing community-based services and on mental health needs. In Wales, a need has been identified for a multidisciplinary rehabilitation service with a care pathway developed for post-COVID-19 syndrome as well as a recovery map. Mr George Robinson. Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, question five. Um, I thank the member. The pandemic has caused manufacturers within the automotive industry actually to close factories for short periods, causing supply chain delays and ultimately reducing the availability of new vehicles, which has caused the Northern Ireland Ambulance Service to experience delays in replacing ambulances. However, my department continues to provide capital funding for the Northern Ireland Ambulance Service fleet replacement programme. And in January 21, following a short delay due to the pandemic, approved the fleet replacement business case for the period 2021 to 2025 26. Mr. Robinson. Thank you. The Minister, for his answer, can the Health Minister give the general public assurances that ambulances will continue to be funded for replacement on a regular basis due to the fact that they are a vital frontline asset for patients of all ages? and also take into account ambulance staff who must have top quality life saving equipment on board. Um, and I thank the member and to, I suppose, to give him an update uh, on the housing update. Our ambulance service actually has a fleet of 330 emergency and non emergency vehicles and these include A E ambulances, patient care services, uh, NISTAR, the rapid response vehicles and support vehicles. There are currently 116 NE ambulances, 112 patient care service vehicles, and 43 rapid response vehicles. 
The vehicles are replaced under a five-year rolling programme, and in January 21, uh, the Department approved a business case for £22.7 million for the replacement of vehicles up until the end of the year 2025-26, and that pro programme allows for a proportion of the fleet to be replaced annually, uh, which spreads, spreads the need for capital funding evenly over the period of replacement and allows it to be planned and managed effectively, thus actually minimising the risk to service operations. Thank you, Minister. That concludes the period for table questions to the Minister. And we move on now to topical questions. Um, if we could call up uh, Mr Pat Catney on the screen. Mr Catney. Thank you, Mr Principal, Deputy Speaker. And thank you, Minister, for your answers. Uh, for the questions so far. Minister, information on Northern Ireland Direct states that from the uh, 24th of May, anyone travelling within the common travel area does not have to isolate, but public health advice is to take a pre-departure lateral flow device test and again on day two and eight post-arrival in Northern Ireland. Can the Minister confirm that this is a legal requirement? Thank you, Minister. Uh, I, I can confirm to the member that these are in guidance at this moment in time because that's how we've managed uh, as an executive common uh, travel within the common travel area. So it is there in guidance. Uh, Minister. Okay, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, to come back in with a supplementary. Yes, certainly. Thank you. Minister, should we not put all of these regulations into law to provide clarity to the public, particularly as lockdown is easing? Um, I think the member, and I think what the executive has tried to do and has done in the last 14 months, is support any travel within the common travel area under regulation, uh, uh, under guidance rather than regulation, because when we put it into enforcement and put it into law, it needs enforcement as well. And whatever, um, I suppose, regulation we put in in regards to travel east-west, we also have to take into consideration then travel north-south and how that would be policed and enforced as well. As an executive, we have taken the decision that uh, travel within the common travel area should be based in, in guidance. It is there for a reason, it is to support the people of Northern Ireland, but also to maintain and provide a level of, of advice uh, to those who wish to travel from other areas coming into Northern Ireland about how they can best look after themselves, but also look after their loved ones who are they, they are either coming to visit, stay with, or even work colleagues that they're, they're, they'll be socialising with now as well, now that some easements have been made. Mr Thomas Buchanan. Speaker, Minister, um, maybe you can give us some indication as to what work your department is doing with the Health and Social Care Trust in order to, um, in an effort, if you like, to reduce waiting times for orthopaedic surgeries. Um, and again, I, I thank the member, and he'll know well that we have uh, established a, a rebuild board in regards to how we get back to the number of surgeries that we have been actually completing in the past. But also in regards to orthopaedic surgeries, why we look for a, a specific reason, uh, hub and spoke model that we had developed, and we build up local capacity as well. We're also using the private sector, uh, and we've actually shortly or shortly recently actually utilised um, orthopaedic operations in the Republic of Ireland as well, where we were able to buy some some provision of operations as well. Why we get back to the full capacity that our health service can provide. Mr. Buchanan. Thank you, um, and thank you, Minister, for your response. The reason I, I asked that question is I have a constituent who waited three and a half years to see a consultant. He saw the consultant about a month ago, and uh, the consultant confirmed that he had to get two hip replacements. But he was told then that he would go on another waiting list up to 240 weeks, which is four years and eight months. That would leave him a total of eight years of yeah, eight years and four months on a waiting list. Now, I think that you will agree with me that that is totally unacceptable. And can you give us any indication as to when orthopaedic surgery will be back in full uh, swing, if you like, within the, well, I'll, I'll refer to the Western Health and Social Care Trust? Um, look, I, I think the member and asked me, you know, in my opinion in regards to that waiting list, of course it's not acceptable uh, since I've come into this post. 
Uh, I've been very clear that those waiting lists are not acceptable, but we must do everything that we can to 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 get in front of them, not just to get back to where we were, because when we look even where we were pre-COVID, those waiting lists were increasing, even without the challenges that COVID has has presented to us. So it's how we look at our rebuilding board, and I know the member has specifically mentioned the Western Trust. What we have been doing is looking at that regional approach so that we take people from the top of the waiting list or with the key priorities and offer them the operation, offer them the service, no matter where uh, that theatre capacity may, may be, so that we can get, a, a, I suppose, a standardisation across Northern Ireland so that those who are waiting the longest don't have to just simply wait on their, their local trust on their waiting list, but we can actually see how, how we can respond as a service to get those waiting lists down. Ms Clare Stockton. Uh, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, Minister, the Health Miscellaneous Provisions Northern Ireland Act received royal assent in May 2016, five years ago. This enabled powers to the Department of Health to prohibit the sale of nicotine products, including e-cigarettes, to under-18s. So five years where children have been able to purchase uh, uh, e-cigarettes. I do appreciate this past year has been a challenge, but what has the, de- uh, the Minister's Department been doing over these past five years to get these regulations into law? Um, I, I, I thank the Member. Um, I can answer in regards to what has happened since January uh, of last year. And as the Member will know, within a number of weeks of coming into the office, we were faced with a pandemic. So there's many pieces of the work uh, that were already in train within the department that were put on hold. Uh, I, I think that is one of them. I will check and get back to the member in detail in writing. I do not have that specific list in front of me or in regards to that issue, but I will respond to it. Ms. Sutton. Uh, thank you, Minister, for your attention. You know, he, he will know that this has a significant impact for, for, for the rest of people's lives, and I would ask him to commit to introducing these regulations before the end of this mandate. As I say, I will check with, with my department where that work has been progressed to, and again I will respond to the member in writing with a, an update as soon as I have it. Mr Roy Beggs. <clears throat> During yesterday's debate on unfettered access to medicines, etc., I was struck on some of the contributions were still stuck on the 1916 Brexit debate, rather than focusing on how we can collectively work. To, add, to avoid the adverse effects on our health service, which are so evident. So, Minister, would you confirm that the requirements in the Northern Ireland Protocol to follow EU medicines regulations as to uh, bureaucracy is likely to add to costs and even the availability of some medicines and so adversely affect the entire community? I, I, I thank the Member. Uh, medicines and medical devices, as we dis- debated yesterday, uh, supplied through the NHS do bring costs advantages uh, to the Northern Ireland Health Services and their distribution through our controlled free NHS and GP prescriptions cannot threaten the EU single market. So, Given that everyone in Northern Ireland would be adversely affected by increased pharmacy costs, um, I, I would think uh, that there has to be a realisation in regards to the implication of what that actually means in regards to the additional bureaucracy, the time supplies, the supply chains that do actually have to be put in place for the delivery of those medicines. Mr. Beggs. Would the Minister confirm that this additional bureaucracy, unnecessary costs, will be a burden on your budget and ultimately mean there is less money being able to be spent in our waiting lists and other pressing issues which uh, we are facing at this time? And again, I thank the member for a supplementary, and as, as was, I think, debated uh, yesterday afternoon in regards to how we now have to look to both MHRA and um, EMA in regards to where medicines are, are licensed, what their uses actually are. It does put an additional strain on the, the, the small team who, who work, uh, along with my chief pharmacy officer, in regards to how we assess what, what medicines are available, but also the additional bureaucracy and management now that is needed because we basically are in two jurisdictions. Uh, and while the, I suppose the grace period is useful to have, uh, it is coming to an end, and that's putting that additional workload on where we seek to ensure those medicine supplies and medical devices are there for the long term and not just solely through the period of the grace period. Um, Ms Sinead McLaughlin, if we can bring her up on the screen. Ms McLaughlin. 
Uh, thank you. Minister, can I ask what action uh, have you taken to provide early medical abortion services in the Western Health and Social Services Trust? Um, again, I, I note the member, member's question and that has been covered um, in this chamber a number of times. Uh, my department is not required under the law uh, to commission abortion services. However, in recognition and anticipation of regulations being introduced by the UK, UK Government from March last year, my department had commenced work to develop a commissioning model on service specification for these services to be delivered in Northern Ireland. Uh, that work was paused from February 2020 due to the need to divert department and HSC staff resources to manage the responses to the pandemic. The Western Health and Social Care Trust uh, has been delivering a service, and as far as I'm aware, they are currently looking to recruit uh, to fill the post that is actually vacant at this moment in time within their trust area. Thank you for your answer. Uh, women in um, my constituency in Derry deserve to have a right and have a right to a full suite of medical abortion and crisis pregnancy services. Minister, I believe that you need to ensure that the Trust meets its legal responsibilities and commission the services that are required. Minister, would you agree? to expect women from Derry to travel outside this jurisdiction, particularly during a pandemic, to access routine health care uh, that is afforded in every other part of the UK is fundamentally wrong and in contradiction to their equality and human rights. Um, in regards to the provision um, of abortion, early, early medical abortion in Northern Ireland, um, as of yet, the executive has yet to come to an agreement on the provision of that service and women who require access to services, um, if not available in their own trust area, uh, can actually contact uh, the British Pregnancy Advisory Service for access to services available, and they may also contact their own GP. Mr. William Humphrey. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer so far. Minister, you will know that the Northern Ireland Hospice, low based in North Belfast, is a regional service. Can I ask you what uh, support you have provided to the hospice this year, and will that support be ongoing as the years progress? Um, I, I thank the member and acknowledge the, the work that the Northern Ireland Hospice actually does provide as a regional service. The member will be aware that uh, not just my department, but also the Department of Finance, made a number of financial. Uh, interventions during the past year in support of the hospice. Um, but the member will also be aware that, as I've obviously said numerous times in the past, I'm constrained by a one-year budget uh, with non-recurrent uh, funding proposals as well. So as we go forward, I have to look to what commitments are actually in place in NDNA as well in regards to palliative care and, and the support of that. Uh, it is a whole executive approach, but it's also one that we need that commitment for a recurrent budget that can allow us to make those long-term commitments. Thank you, and I would, would encourage the Minister to, to fight for the resource for the hospice. Minister, you will be aware that during the COVID pandemic, the Matter Hospital has played a key and pivotal role in terms of being one of the COVID hospitals. Can I ask the Minister, uh, does he value the, the role that the Matter plays in terms of the, the Greater Belfast area in terms of medical care? And can he assure us of the protection of services for the Matter uh, and the, as a hospital going forward? Um, and I, I thank the member for his question. The matter has played uh, a vital and crucial role uh, within our fight against COVID, but it also plays a vital and crucial role in our recovery process as well. And I actually raised and, and discussed the issue with the chair of the Belfast Health and Social Care Trust when I last met him about the value uh, that we place on the matter hospital as part of our, our footprint, as part of our entire health estate because we need every square foot of it. Now, the provision of the service may not be the same as it was pre-COVID, but I can assure the member that it is a vital part and a vital link uh, to our health service here in Northern Ireland. Mr Keith Buchanan. Speaker, uh, Minister, can you give us a brief update just on the oxygen generators that was shipped to India and what work they are currently doing or if they are operational at this stage? Um, I, I thank the member uh, for his question on this, this, this subject as well, because I think it was a fantastic example of what we can do here in the health service in Northern Ireland. Um, what has not been, I suppose, acknowledged greatly, that the three generators that we were able to ship were actually manufactured here uh, in Northern Ireland with support with engineering from the Belfast Trust, 
uh, those three generators have arrived in India. Uh, I'm aware that two of them have already been uh, connected to hospital supplies. The third one is actually undergoing commissioning works at the minute, but we expect to receive an update in the next few days in regards to the full operation of those three generators and the vital part that they're playing in regards to helping India uh, combat COVID-19 and supporting the patients with the, a supply of oxygen, a supply of oxygen that has been engineered, uh, developed, designed and built here in Northern Ireland. I'm sorry, there's, we've run out of time for a supplementary, but you can, you can get them later. Um, and uh, if members would just take their ease, um, we'll move back then to the motion on mental health awareness week in a few moments. Thank you.